Hi, everyone. Um, so, Sally is not your typical startup founder. <laughs> she has uh, been the CFO of Citibank. Yes. Uh, the CEO of Smith Barney. Yes. A variety of positions, seven prominent. Merrill Lynch. Uh, I'm sorry? Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch, sorry. Merrill Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> um, seven prominent financial institutions altogether, and could well have stayed in the banking establishment if you so chose to. But uh, you decided a few years ago that you wanted to get into startups instead. And we're particularly excited because today you're going to be taking the wraps off of your new uh, startup, Elevest, right. um, which has received some coverage, but she's going to be sort of sharing the details about the company for the first time today. So thank yeah. you so much for thank coming. Thank you, Connie. Thank you for having me. So let's start off by exactly you know who it is that you're targeting. Well, first of all, you said I did, I think you said something about I decided to become an entrepreneur. I didn't. Uh, what I decided is that we that I need to so help solve a problem. That we have a gender investing gap in this country. We all talk about the gender pay gap, but we have a gender investing gap that can cost some women thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, for some women millions of dollars over the course of their lives in comparison to the guys. And solving this gender investing gap is good for all of us because it earns the women more money, it gives them a better life to lead their families, and it drives capital into the market. So it's all good. That's great. So exactly how is this going to work? Well, it's what we decided to do. So when I started this, I thought, you know, I guess we're going to have to give them a lot of content and a lot of financial education, a lot of remedial financial education, because everybody knows that women aren't as good at math as men which actually is not true, that women aren't as good investors as men, which actually isn't true, that women need more financial education than men, which is a red herring. Everybody needs more financial education, but men still invest through it. I even thought for a while the other myth, women don't even have any money. Oh my gosh, they control $5 trillion of investable assets. Then I was told they need more hand-holding. No. When there's jargon out there, and we put jargon up, Sure, they need to be walked through it, whereas the guys will invest through it. And so as I started to look at it, I really started, I actually started with a, women really need to explore their emotions around money before they can invest. And that was my own gender bias. So <laughs> what we're doing is we said, forget it. We're gonna throw all of this out, all of these myths that have perpetuated for so long, and we're actually going to spend hundreds and hundreds of hours with women and co-create a platform with them for what they're looking for in investing. Okay, great. So this is basically like a, a robo-advisory firm, is that safe you know, to say? I am not a huge fan of that term. Okay. Uh, I think it was a term that began, you know, was used by the industry as a way of sort of dismissing the digital investment platforms, mm -hmm. but it is a digital investment platform, which from what I see, and I've been in, around in the industry as long as, well, as long as anyone, really, mm -hmm. um, it's going to provide a more comprehensive financial plan, a bespoke investment plan, and we've completely rethought risk. Again, working with women for what they're looking for. So is there a minimum uh, threshold uh, in terms of assets? No. Because our goal was to make this approachable and achievable for all women. Mm -hmm. And we've put together, in addition to not having a minimum asset threshold, we're actually giving women free financial plans. So this financial plan is so cool, I can't even tell you, okay? I cannot even tell you. But you need to tell me. But I'm gonna now tell you. <laughs> so now I'm gonna tell you. What we do is we ask a woman what goal she wants to achieve in life. So, you know, the industry typically says, we want you to help, we wanna help achieve your goals. And then the light FM music starts to play. The sun comes through the trees, <laughs> right? The angels begin to sing. And what these women told us is, I am not friggin' Celine Dion, I am Beyonce. And I have goals I want to achieve in life. And by the way, it's not to outperform the market indices. Mm -hmm. That's not it. I want to start my own business. I want to retire well, I want to have a child, I want to buy a home. This is what I want to do. And so we put together, and we'll do this for anybody, a full financial plan that not only takes into account her goals and when she wants to achieve them and gives them guidance on how much money she'll need, mm -hmm because the blank piece of paper is so tough, the really great thing we do that nobody else does is we take into account her earnings, her, earn, her salary arc, because you can't plan if you can, you're not planning how much money you'll make. And I'm sorry to tell 
the ladies, um, we tend to still earn less than the men, and sadly, our salary peaks out in our 40s as opposed to our 60s. Okay. And we live longer. And so we are using and powerful, cost what's that? I was gonna say, I, th I think things sort of typically cost more for women as well. Well, there's that too, the whole makeup tax and so on. Um, but so if you're going to plan, no one else does this, you have to use powerful technology, powerful finance, mm -hmm. in order to take into account her unique circumstances. We're the only ones who will do that. So this isn't for women, pink it and shrink it, mm -hmm. make it smaller. This is for women, we are going to forecast out your life so that you can achieve your goals. And then we'll put a bespoke investment portfolio against each goal to help her achieve them. Who are you working with to create these portfolios for women? Say I want to I sign on, I tell you what I'm making, okay. I want to save up this, for This This was a very hard part. So one of the things I think most folks don't know is that you can launch a registered investment advisor, you can launch a digital platform, and not really have financial services experience. It's crazy. It's crazy, right? Because this is not an engineering problem. It's also a financial problem. So before I started this, I said, look, I've been around for a long time. Um, I've got to find somebody unbelievable. Uh, and it took me more than a year to find our chief investment officer, Sylvia Kwan, mm -hmm. who has a PhD from Stanford in engineering economic systems okay. and an undergrad from Brown um, in applied math and computer science. This woman's brain is as big as this stage. <laughs> and so I said, first I've got to find her, and then we've got to take this Sylvia thing, the Sylvia person, and then we need to leverage her with technology. We also have as our lead um, Series A investor, Morningstar, which is doing, to my mind, the best research and has the best analytics and data on investing for individuals out there. So it was also important for me not for it just to be me and Sylvia in the office debating financial theory, but to have a partner like that where we can pull on as a, a client their data and analytics. Okay. And then, and then, I said, all right, now we're gonna try to have as few people from financial services as possible because they've had the opportunity to try to solve this for, oh, you know, like 60 years. So we pulled in a product manager from Weight Watchers, Behavior Change in Women. Oh, great. We have a lead designer who led the redesign of Vogue.com, so it's beautiful. We have a FinTech entrepreneur as the president. Um, and we have a chief, a chief technology officer from Thrillist. So we said, okay, throw everybody in with all of these women and let's try to recreate this from the bottom up. It sounds like an interesting team. But um, what are the products that you're using exactly? So it'll be managed ETFs, uh, managed exchange traded funds because it's important to try to keep the cost down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really where the value of investing is, it, is, it, is in asset allocation. Mm -hmm. And so we spend a lot of time, we have 21 asset classes, others have 11 or 13 or 15, because asset diversification is, is one of the most powerful things in finance. So it sounds like what we're talking about here is sort of very goal-oriented. Yes. Um, and I know that you know, you'd sort of said that women are very good at risk management, but you've, you've also pointed out that women live longer, they make yeah. less. So should the focus be, or maybe is there a component um, to provide women with sort of um, higher risk, higher yeah. yield returns to make so up for that. that you, so you're bringing up a really important point. Um, and what we discovered, so if, you, you, if a guy comes in and meets with an advisor and you say, how much risk do you want to take? The guys will say either good bit, I want to be aggressive. Sometimes they'll say medium, right? A woman says, I have no idea. I have to go study this. I have to, you know, women love to get A's. I have to go get an A in risk management and I'll come back to you and then she doesn't. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even beyond that, I would say that me saying to you, Connie, hey, what's your risk tolerance? I mean, you tell me, what is it, right? I don't know. And by the way, I don't either right now. I don't either. Why? Because I don't know what you want to do in your life. If what you want to do in your life is ha buy a house in four years, mm -hmm. you can't take much risk. If all you want to do, if you've got, you're sort of set, all you're thinking about is retirement and building wealth, then you can take on a fair amount of risk. And so for the same individual, if they have different goals, they need differing amounts of risk. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're turning risk inside out and we're rethinking it for. We're not asking her how much risk she wants to take. What we're doing is we're saying, Connie, for your goal of retire well, mm -hmm. you can have a fair amount of risk because you're like 23, right? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. And so at 23, you know, if you're gonna retire at 68, we're gonna put you in a 90% equity portfolio mm -hmm. because you've got time to make it up. For shorter ones, we'll put you in less. And here's what we do that we think is really innovative and disruptive. 
which is that we will, because we know you're risk aware, mm -hmm. we will, we construct our portfolios to get you to your goal or better in 70% of market scenarios. So 70% or better, um, which is not what anyone else does. And we will not set your portfolio like others do and leave it. We will actively monitor it and shift it over time to keep you there in the significant, getting to your goals in the significant majority of markets. How will you do that? How are you going to be sort of just re reaching out to your clients regularly to, s to learn about life changes or how will they be prompted to? We, we need to keep up with our clients so they can tell us, mm. um, you know, I got a raise, I changed my goal, I actually want to retire earlier, I got a bonus, et cetera. So there, there of course has to be engagement and we recognize that as a fiduciary, we need to encourage that engagement. And how will you be charging clients? Percentage of assets? Yep, uh, 50 basis points, percentage of assets, which is a lot lower than what the traditional financial advisors charge. Um, and not the cheapest, and not the cheapest. That was not our goal. As we talked to women, they said, I don't want the cheapest, right? What I want is the one that's the best for me and that is tailored to me. And alone amongst anyone else, we're gonna give them this full personalized financial plan, this highly customized investment portfolio and ongoing risk management. And oh, the other cool thing we're doing is we've also told them if you fall off track for your goals, mm -hmm. if you get from a 70% probability to 60, 50%, we're gonna reach out to you. We're going to tell you you're off track and then we're gonna tell you in a highly personalized way what you need to get back on. Invest another thousand dollars, retire two years later. Um, we've got patents pending. So again, this isn't pink and shrink it. We have patents pending on that as well as a personalized plan. We have four patents pending. That's great and it's live today. Yes, go look today. Wonderful. So Sally, I have to ask you, yes. you've had a pretty storied career. Um, being an entrepreneur is not easy. Why did you decide to do a startup at this point in your career when you could easily become, you know, just an investor yeah. or pursue some other passion? Yeah, and the, I mean, I, I am having sort of a surreal moment, I have to tell you, to be here. I, I'm thinking with, given what I've done in my past, I wouldn't have imagined I'd be here now. But as I said when we started, it's not about I want to be an entrepreneur and wear this super cool leather jacket. <laughs> um, it's really about I saw this gender investing gap. And I'll tell you, at first I said, you know what? This is not what I do. So I see this gender investing gap. I see the fact that it can have a broader impact on the economy. The retirement savings crisis is a woman's crisis, mm -hmm. right? This is, some, this is this opportunity I identify. So I actually went out and met with a number of CEOs for the large banks and said, look, I'm not gonna do this, this is not what I do, you should do this, let me give you all the numbers, you know, and I'll help, I'll, don't even, I won't even charge you for it, I'm gonna help you build this. And I remember sitting down with one CEO in particular and I went through, women have $5 trillion of investable assets, 90% of us manage our money on our own at some point in our lives, we're about to inherit 70% of the $40 trillion of wealth transfer, but we're underinvested. Women today, so if financial advisors, the traditional industry, when our husbands die, we leave our financial advisor more than 70% of the time over the next year. That's we, we keep 68, 70% of our assets in cash. So I went and sat down and told the CEO all this stuff, and he looked back at me and he said, but don't their husbands manage their money for them? And I said, you didn't even hear me. And so as I began to think about it, I thought coming from the traditional industry, I don't think we're gonna solve it. And in fact, the traditional in finance industry, I'm not sure if we sat down and thought about making it more male that we could, right? It's a lot of war analogies, sports analogies, picking winners, betting on markets. Um, you know, a lot of the programming, the TV programming is very sports oriented. Hell, heck, whoops. The symbol of the, the industry is a bull. Right. It's a bull. Right? So I said, you know what, coming from the traditional industry, I think you need to step back and get a fresh perspective and think of this from the ground up. And, if, and you know what? If not me, who? And I actually owe it to, the, to professional women. If not me, who? I think it's wonderful. And of course, a $5 trillion market is a big market to be chasing. But you are cutting out you know, half the population uh, in your sort of target. Um, I'm just also wondering, you know, the things that you're talking about, do you expect that they're gonna change over time? I mean, how much of this is nature versus nurture? Do you yeah. think that women are yeah. inherently more risk averse? I, I, or look, that they just haven't yeah. had, you know? Yeah, so first of all, in terms of cutting out half the market, I would say today the entire industry mm -hmm. 
implicitly targets men because of that stock picking, right, product picking, sports analogies, war analogies, that no one would say they do it, but the numbers are the numbers. 85% of the advisors in the industry are male, right? And as a result, oftentimes for many companies, you hear 85% of the clients are male. For some um, investing TV shows, it's 90%. Mm -hmm. So to have us talking to the market of women, I don't feel like, oh, we're, we're leaving the guys out. I feel like, look, we're beginning to include the women. This doesn't hurt anybody. And I think you know that if you're talking to everybody, you're talking to nobody. And so there are issues that we want to talk to women about, like a career break. So if, you know, if I were to say to you, Connie, you're going to take a two-year career break, you're making 85K a year, how much will that cost you? You'd say, Sally, that's 170K. Say, actually, Connie, it costs you more than a million dollars over the course of your career because you'll take, on average, a salary cut of 20% and then get your raises off that lower level. Mm -hmm. Nobody's having that conversation, but obviously as a woman that keeps you, can keep you from achieving your goals. So it isn't, we don't like the guys, we love the guys. I'm married, I've been married to a couple of them, right? <laughs> we love the guys, but this is about talking with and engaging with women in a smart, technology-driven, sophisticated financial capability that is as beautiful as any other website you see out there. And uh, to that point, that there are a couple of other competitors, yeah. um, including, I think, Worth FM. Yeah. Oh, I, I, can you sort of explain to potential clients out there how your business differs? Like, yeah. what are the biggest distinctions? I'd say the difference is, for, for, not to talk about any, any one of them, and by the way, there's room for a whole bunch, mm -hmm. right? If you think about the firms that are serving the guys, it's Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, UBS, E-Trade, Ameritrade, you know, Robert Baer, Dane Rauscher, Personal Capital, Wealthfront, you know, I mean, right. Betterman, go on and right, on, right. right? So if there happen to be a handful serving, you know, targeting and serving women, fantastic. What I'll tell you is I started, where I started was let's take an existing offering and throw some content over the top, mm -hmm. right? And about, and in fact, what I really started was let's, you know, let's take these women emotionally to get them from being nervous about money to, you know, to being confident about money. And then I came to the, as we began to engage with women, I came to the recognition that if it was just what was out there and some content, what's out there is out there and there's lots of content. So yeah, you know, the, will there be opportunities? Certainly. For us, the opportunity to rethink this thing from the ground up, and as I said, take into account women's salary curves, her risk preferences, right, to really work with her on this was just too big an opportunity, I thought. It just needs fresh thinking. Uh, you know, you mentioned something earlier when we sat down, which was that a lot of people are entering this field that don't have necessarily banking backgrounds. Right. Um, you, at one point in your career, I think when you were um, restructured, as you might say, out of your last big banking job. Or fired. Or fired. Right. <laughs> um, you had talked about or thought about uh, taking the top job at the SEC. Yeah. Uh, we saw... Um, uh, somebody get uh, fired this week from their job at an online lending company, which is uh, overseen, I think, by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But uh, in terms of uh, financial advisories, which I think are um, overseen by the SEC, do you think that there's enough oversight? Uh, there's so much oversight. There's so much oversight. Um, that being said, you always need to check, do a gut check of whether oversight is in the right places. So. You know, again, as we, we looked at it, the, and there's so much bad financial advice out there. The one that has sent me over the edge over the past couple of weeks is I keep seeing this advice that tells women, you know, specifically that they shouldn't pay down their credit card before they build up an emergency fund. It's, un it's just unbelievable advice. It's, it's, it's money costing advice. And, and you look at that and you say, okay, that's a, re you know, if you're, if you're getting that kind of stuff, that's a reason people don't trust the industry as much. Mm -hmm. And so it's fascinating to me that the regulators will regulate, you know, line items on things, ads and so on, um, but they don't have real guidance on this is how much financial experience should be within one of these organizations, or this is how much compliance experience should be right. within them. Um, and so we, you know, we built that we raised more money than most do to start off. 10 million. 10 million. And part of it was because we had to have, you know, we had to have that compliance capability. We had to have that you know, that investing capability. We really had to do this right and, in, and really earn the trust of, of these women. It's, it's their money, it's their future. I mean, this stuff, 
you know, is, is really, really, really important. Great, and I'm glad you're taking it so seriously. Thank you. We're out of time, but thank you so thank much, Thank you, Sally. Connie. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Our pleasure.